Welcome everyone to our special webinar today, uh, which is top tips for designing and delivering great presentations. Um, and we're going to spend the majority of the time focused on presentation figures, uh, but we're also going to cover some of the less thought of aspects of presentations as well. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a demo of BioRender, but I also wanted to share some general presentation tips uh, if you ever needed to, uh, to use other tools like PowerPoint or Keynote as you go and like, you know, prepare your slide decks. Um, and again, uh, if you haven't done so already, you can sign up for your BioRender account following the link that's on the screen. Um, and I'm going to put this into the chat just one more time here. Apologies for anyone that has already been in the room. Um, this is going to be a, just a duplicated message. Um, so I'm just going to put that in there. So feel free to create an account. If you have an account, sign in um, and then we can uh, follow along today. And thanks to everyone for you know sharing your thoughts in the chat as well about uh, where you uh, kind of pull in your, your information from. Uh, really helpful for us to to understand that. Um, and yeah, the link will just take you to the sign up page here. So feel free to set up your account if you haven't done so. Um, and just a few housekeeping items before we jump into things here. Um, if you first, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them in the Q and A section in the Zoom window. Uh, when you do, remember to address the question to both panelists and attendees so that everyone can see the question that you're asking. Uh, and then you can use the chat to say hi or chat with your teammates if you'd like. Um, I'm also joined by my colleagues, uh, Kat, Jocelyn, and Sam, uh, who will be helping me answer questions uh, that come in through the Q&A. Uh, so feel free at any time if you have any thoughts that you want to share, um, any, uh, any questions that you have, feel free to put it in there. I will be sure to get to your question. And at the end, if there's uh, time left over, uh, we'll also cover some of the things that I think might be helpful to show directly within the platform as well. So don't hesitate to uh, ask your questions like whenever they, uh, they come in. Um, and so for those of you who are brand new to BioRender, uh, I just wanted to give sort of a quick overview of, you know, what, uh, what we actually are. Um, so BioRender is a graphics making tool, uh, and it was developed by our, uh, because our co-founder Shizaoki realized during her time as a medical illustrator that many scientists and labs don't really have the budget nor the resources to visually translate their science. Um, and you can kind of see some examples, uh, an example on the left hand side there of like, you know, some of the illustrations we uh, would typically be creating. Um, and this really, this was like that spark that drove the founding of BioRender because we wanted to give everyone the tools and the practical knowledge to be able to visually communicate their research and allow everyone to clearly convey their message visually. And here are just some of the common ways that we see BioRender uh, being used. Um, and so for those of you who are, you know, veterans of the platform, you probably already know this, but really you can use it to create figures across your entire scientific journey, starting all the way from the ideation and brainstorming phases, all the way up to your publications, to your patents, your posters, and hopefully even more in the future. Uh, and of course, for today, our focus is going to be on the presentations that you're creating. Um, and as scientists, I'm sure that everyone here knows, like I'm just preaching to the choir here, um, but presenting our work is a very important part of science, like whether we're presenting to our own team, to other departments, at conferences, um, or presenting like, you know, project progress to leadership at, you know, our annual uh, sort of uh, progress meetings. It's a critical part in making sure our work is understood and to make sure that we make well-informed decisions regarding the direction that we take our research in. Um, and the challenge here is that the people we're presenting to often have way too much to do and like way too little time to do it in. Um, and so in the limited amount of time that we have their attention and their focus, we want to make sure that they understand our message clearly. And that's where the tips that we're going to cover today, uh, that's what they're going to address, like how to get our message across the most efficiently to the audiences that we're presenting to. Um, today is going to be broken up into roughly three parts here. Uh, we'll first do a quick review of our hardware and software um, that will be helpful to help engage our audiences. Uh, and then afterwards, we're going to first look at some design tips for when you're creating your overall slide deck. And then finally, uh, for the, the majority of the time as well, we're going to focus on the design tips specifically for the figures that you're creating for your presentations. Um, and just so that it's not distracting for anyone, I'm going to end the poll first. Thank you, everyone uh, who responded here. Uh, it's been really insightful to get um, to, to get your feedback. 
Um, and uh, and before we jump into this again, uh, you'll notice that we don't have a dedicated Q and A. Uh, so if there are any questions that you have, ask whenever. Pop them into the Q and A or into the chat. Um, we're joined by my colleagues who can uh, who will be keeping an eye on that and making sure that we are able to get to your questions. So feel free to ask anything that you have in mind. All right. With that in mind. Um, Let's start off here with a quick review of our hardware and software that when we uh, when we go to present. Um, and with many of us, you know, meeting regularly over Zoom and presenting virtually already, we might not always stop and think about the equipments that we're using to present. Um, so first things first, audio quality from the audience's point of view can really make or break your presentation. And I have a uh, sort of, uh, you know, spectrum here to give you a sense of the audio quality from different types of microphones. Um, and so at the, the one end here, we have our AirPods, we have, you know, laptop speakers or microphones, we have gaming headsets, you know, dedicated microphones, as well as, you know, these uh, teleconferencing headsets as well. Um, and what may be surprising here are that uh, gaming headsets are only fall in the middle. And the reason for that is um, gaming headsets are great because they can give you that, uh, you know, very clear and crisp sound for you to hear all those little details in the game, you know, any footsteps, movement, you know, the ambiance, um, all of that is, uh, it delivers it in very great quality. But they're not always designed to have the best microphone quality just because that's not like their main use. Um, and it's just something to be aware of. And it's very similar for devices like AirPods or similar headphones as well, because they're designed to give you really good sound, but not necessarily optimized for microphone quality. So something to keep in mind there. And what I want to actually do here is to, to just a very quick test to kind of highlight the differences um, in microphone quality and how that can actually impact the presentation. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually switch over to my uh, laptop's microphone. So I'm just going to switch over here. Uh, and maybe you'll be able to hear that change almost immediately. Uh, you, it's going to sound like I'm a little bit more distant, uh, a little bit more echoey. Um, and I'm actually in a room that has carpet, so that helps with the echo a little bit. But if you imagine presenting in like a conference room that has like, you know, hardwood floors, concrete walls, that's going to be like very echoey and like, uh, more difficult for your audiences uh, to to follow along with. And if you imagine, you know, listening to this kind of quality for like an hour, it's going to be a little bit more taxing. Um, and what I'll do now is actually switch back to my headset microphone. Uh, and hopefully right away, you can kind of hear that difference, um, that the sound's a little bit more lush. There's a lot less echo. It doesn't sound like I'm very far away from you. Um, and that's because, you know, the microphone is just closer to my mouth. Um, and I'm not advocating for any specific brands or any specific microphone. Um, but what you're looking for is something that uh, is designed for teleconferencing and something that has like a microphone that, you know, again, is just closer to your mouth because there's less um, uh, there's less room for like that sound to bounce around. Um, and you can hear like with these um, uh, with this microphone. Uh, we're actually, it, it's going to be like a, like an easier listening experience. Um, so hopefully that kind of highlights like, you know, the impact that just simply changing your microphone can have on your, on your presentation. Um, and the take home message here is to ask a friend to test your audio quality together. Um, or alternatively, you can even like, um, that record yourself speaking and then play it back for yourself so that you have a sense of what it sounds like from the audience's perspective. Um, and just try it out with different microphones. You can get a feel for like what everything sounds like. And then um, and then if your uh, if your colleagues are have sorry, if your colleagues have you know poor audio quality during their presentation, um, it's not, it's um, it's actually in their benefit to be able to, to, to for you to tell them. It's kind of like telling someone. They, that they have something in their teeth um, by letting them know that like their audio quality isn't isn't the best um, it allows them to adjust that and, and and like essentially fix that issue because having that poor audio quality can really take away from the message that they're trying to deliver and again going back to that point of people like having uh, you know too little time and like very little time to uh, uh, to learn about new things um, you want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for your audience to engage with your uh, presentation and having, you know, a good sound quality is uh, is an important part of that. 
Um, and now that we have sort of that uh, quick review or PSA for um, using a uh, like about, about sound quality, what I want to do is actually talk about uh, some design tips that we can look at when we're building our slide decks. Um, and even before we get into that, I think something that we should uh, think about uh, are things that we should avoid uh, putting into our into our deck. So this is actually this whole slide here actually covers all of the things that we want to avoid. Um, and you can kind of take this as like the blueprints of what not to do for your slides. Um, so first, you want to avoid gradient backgrounds. Uh, and there's two reasons why we want to avoid this. The first is that it's difficult to do tastefully. Um, often when you have gradients, um, it, it sort of dates your presentation a little bit. It makes it look a little bit uh, older. Um, and secondly, is that it creates inconsistent legibility. Um, and the reason for that is you're going to have some parts of your slide which are darker, others that are lighter. And having a consistent legibility as like you go through like that gradient is going to be much more difficult as opposed to having just like a solid color background where everything is going to be much more uniform. Um, especially like if you have gradients that are become more severe, you'll have the, like maybe this middle area is even uh, even lighter than usual. You'll This part of the font will almost like disappear into the background before coming back afterwards. And it just has like that, you know, uh, th that contrast is not consistent throughout. Um, the next thing that you want to do is avoid drop shadows. You can see that for all of my text here, I have almost like a shadowing effect that uh, pops uh, that is underneath my uh, underneath my text. And it's something that you want to avoid mainly because it's distracting to the reader. It's like another element that we're adding here that the reader needs to interpret. Um, and so by removing that, we actually help the audience focus on our key messages and um, we have less of those like decorative effects. Um, we also want to avoid using very harsh colors, like the bright yellow that we're using in our, uh, for the uh, font up here. Um, and the reason for that is having very harsh or very like strong colors acts like a spotlight. Um, and so when you have like those super bright colors, our eyes are automatically attracted to that range. And what we want to do is limit those colors uh, for only very special uh, circumstances. For example, if I wanted to highlight a protein of interest and and be able to and allow my audience to kind of follow that protein throughout, if I have it as a very bright color that stands out from the rest of my illustration, it's very easy to identify that, hey, like that's an important protein, like I should pay attention to it. And that works because we limit the amount of uh, very bright colors that we're using. Um, and then next, we want to also avoid using decorative bullet fonts, um, bullet points, sorry. You can see here, I have some like fancier ones. Uh, but again, like um, it might look, uh, what it does is it sort of dates your presentation a little bit. Having a, uh, like a standard dot or a dash creates a more timeless look that, uh, so that regardless of when a person comes to see, uh, when, when people go to like watch the presentation, it looks, uh, it looks like it was just, you know, yesterday that it was created. Um, and finally, we want to avoid serif fonts and instead focus on using sans serif fonts. Um, and I'll get into this in a bit more detail uh, in a few more slides, uh, but something to consider as well. Uh, and again, it goes back to that idea of legibility. Um, and here is an example of why we want to avoid using uh, uh, serif fonts and instead focusing on sans serif fonts. Uh, and the reason for that is that the sans serif font is, um, again, it makes the deck look just a little bit older. Um, and it's not to say that there isn't a time and place to use serif font. It's actually a great way for reading large bodies of text like papers, uh, because with the little serifs, um, it, it turns the word almost into a picture as opposed to individual letters, so that it really helps uh, you, it helps you to read the sentences a little bit faster. Uh, alternatively, though, when you are going into a presentation, uh, using a sans serif font is uh, actually easier to read uh, because there's like less like distractions from the serifs themselves. Um, and it's uh, uh, more valuable, like when you are putting it into presentations, again, look, making it look cleaner, and it's just an easier font to read for your for your audience. Um, and as we continue, like looking at, you know, tips for designing our slide decks, what I wanted to kind of show you is like the impact that this can have. And I have um, sort of a, a sample slide deck that I've uh, generated here. Um, and um, 
what we can do is actually one the, the thing to keep in mind here is to keep a consistent look and feel for your entire deck so i have like this theme that's built out and we can actually flip through these different slides um and then you can actually see um that despite having all these different arrangements and layouts they all carry a very uh, this, uh, the same color schemes, as well as having uh, very consistent fonts throughout. And it allows your uh, entire deck to look much more cohesive and unified. Uh, and if you have company colors, um, you can also edit a master slide deck uh, as well. So in Google Slides, if you go to View and then go to Theme Builder, you'll be able to make those large scale changes across your entire slide deck. So if we change that uh, top uh, that top level deck, it would apply our changes to all the subsequent formats as well. So again, helping us feel, give it a more consistent look. Um, but I imagine that for many of us here today that um, the companies that we work for will have a branded slide template for us to use. And that's actually fantastic. Again, it goes back to that uh, idea of having a cohesive and standardized um, uh, slide deck um, so that we have like that consistent feel as well as uh, being able to use and incorporate those company colors as well. So branded slide decks are a great way for us to, uh, to, to build our slides from. Um, and one suggestion that I do have for everyone here is that regardless of whether you're using like a slide deck in Google or if you are creating uh, something uh, or if you're building off of like a brand slide deck that's provided to you, what you want to try and aim for is that having is to have your first slide and your last slide match. And the reason for that is it forms almost like a nice bookend for your presentation. Um, so you can see that like very clearly, this is the start of my uh, presentation and this is my end. And it almost creates like a, uh, like a sandwich that we can fill with our content in between. Um, and while we're on this last slide as well, take advantage of it. We spend a lot of time on this last slide here. If you imagine like any seminar, any presentation that you've been a part of, when we when uh, it's time for like questions and Q and A and the discussion, that last slide is up for most of that time, um, and so while we have uh, our audience essentially looking at this slide. Uh, use it to your advantage, you know, incorporate any sort of the contact information or like key information that you really want your audience to walk away with. Um, you can use it to add kudos or shout outs uh, to your collaborators. Um, the main point here is to take advantage of like the amount of time that this last slide is on the screen, uh, because you can use it to really um, ingrain uh, the information that you want your audience to take away. Um, and one last tip that I'll leave you here with um, is more often than not, you know, we'll have to create this slide with a bunch of logos, mix of like PNG, some with transparent backgrounds, other without, others without transparent backgrounds. Um, rather than having to try and find a transparent background for every single one of these files, Instead, what you can actually do is just create a white background instead. So regardless if you are able to find something that has that is with or without background, with, with uh, having just like a white block behind it all, um, it looks much more even. So bit of a bit of like a pro tip uh, in case you do, if you are having troubles finding a um, uh, an image without the without a transparent background. Ha sorry, if you're having trouble finding an image with a transparent background, just applying sort of like a white block behind everything can help save you from that time. Um, definitely would have helped me. Like I can't imagine, I can't remember like the number of times uh, I've been like struggling trying to find like an appropriate quality or appropriate resolution uh, or quality image that has like no background is a bit of a time, time consuming thing and you want to be able to spend your time elsewhere. I'm just going to take a quick pause here and just gonna take a quick peek to see if there are any uh, questions that have come in. I think um, the team has done a great job of fielding the questions so far. So feel free to, you know, continue to add any questions that you have. Um, we're happy to, you know, uh, uh, kind of dive into anything that you want to see more of. Um, and again, if there are like certain features on the platform that would be helpful to show uh, if there's time at the end, we'll also be covering some of that as well. All right, and now continuing on uh, with like creating our slide deck here, um, what we might be tempted to do with, uh, you know, when we put on figures, and this is something that I'm guilty of as well, like it's not, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, like I've I've done this exact same thing. I've taken, 
uh, figures from like, let's say I've prepared for a publication and then just stick it directly into my presentation. Um, but what it does, it actually makes it more difficult to follow. And the reason being is that on a, on a publication, for example, there's a lot more real estate, uh, but when we put it into a slide deck, for example, a lot of that text becomes like quite small to read. And that there's a lot of information that uh, we'd have to cover on that slide deck or on that particular slide. And so what's easy, if we have like the six panel uh, figure, what we do is break that up into six separate slides. Uh, and that way we can keep our audience focus on the specific panel that we want them to be paying attention to. And then also in terms of like font sizes and legibility, it's a lot clearer because we're able to blow that image up quite a bit more. Um, and it's just something that we should be aware of. I know like since, um, uh, since like, uh, there's a lot of more virtual presentations now, um, and many of us have a dedicated screen during presentations. It's something that we're able to sort of gloss over a bit more because if things are small, you can kind of lean forward uh, and try and blow it up a little bit on your own personal screen. Um, but as there, as we go back into you know in-person presentations, you know having uh, you know one shared screen for everyone, um, it's something to keep in mind that like legibility is uh, is going to be uh, key as. Um, uh, legibility is going to be key to allow people to, to kind of follow along. All right. Um, and now that we've sort of covered those general tips for presentations and decks, what I want to do is shift gears a little bit now and talk specifically about the design tips for when we go and create figures for our slides. And what I will do now, I'm just going to hop over into, uh, into bar render itself. Um, and for anyone that's uh, uh, new today, I'm just going to start from the very beginning to give everyone uh, just like a quick orientation so that you are able to follow along. Um, so when you first sign into your account, you land here in your gallery. This is where you're going to find all of the illustrations that you've created before. And I'm just going to give this a quick refresh. Um, you can find all of the illustrations that you've created before, as well as any illustrations that have been shared with you. Um, and you're going to see them here by default. You land in your My Files page. Um, and then on the left hand side, you're able to create, you know, folders for yourselves to stay a little bit more organized, you know, house the projects or house the figures that pertain to certain projects. And down below, this is where you're going to find any files that have been shared with you. Uh, so in a sense, here in the gallery, this is where you're going to find everything that you have access to. And to edit and get into any one of these files, just click on it to open it up. This fires it up into the editor where we're able to then start making um, our uh, making changes and start editing our, our illustration. Um, and it just as a quick overview uh, for anyone that is completely new to the platform, uh, BioRender behaves very similarly to Legos, uh, where we have pre-made building blocks that you can uh, assemble together to create your illustration. And the three building blocks that you'll most likely encounter are the icons, the brushes, um, and the arrows themselves, which are under the lines tab. Um, and so in the icons library, you'll find all of the icons in the icons tab. Uh, we do split them up into different categories. And actually we, at the, the icon library is huge. I think it incorporates like almost like 50,000 different scientific entities, uh, ranging from cell types to macromolecules, human anatomy, objects in the lab, which is actually my favorite uh, category, especially the machinery and tech one, uh, because inside you'll actually see all the different uh, like real uh, pieces of equipment that are used in the lab and is represented in like the BioRender style. So when you go to create like your protocols, when you're going to create or demonstrate like the apparatus that you're using, um, have being able to like, create an illustration that like accurately represents what you actually do in the lab is just super powerful. Um, like for me, I thought one of the coolest things is like having like this analytical balance is like the exact same one that I use in my lab is probably the same one that you might find in your lab as well. Um, and then like same with like a number of other pieces of equipment. Uh, it's like super cool. And like definitely recommend just browsing through to see what might be available uh, for you to use. Um, and same with like the brushes as well, like the brushes um, al allow you to take a lot of like that tediousness, like out of creating our, our figures. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, folks in the room have had to do this before, but like building a fossil lipid bilayer from scratch was like the worst process. I imagine that at least some of you are nodding along with me right now because you've had to do this before. Um, 
but using a brush now, it actually takes a lot of that uh, time and energy out of like creating our, our membrane. Uh, because now what we can do is just drop the brush into our onto our page. And from here, if we need to change the structure at all in any way, we can actually just bend this brush by playing around with the, uh, by bending like that blue line. So we can actually start to create like some very customized uh, shapes and structures um, that we can then incorporate into our illustration without having to, you know, copy and paste hundreds of different of these units. They're just added in for you. Um, seeing some thumbs up and hearts here. Um, so glad to hear that this is going to be helpful to some folks. Um, and additionally, um, because these are actually made up of individual units within, if we needed to uh, get a little bit more specific um, and then like mark like certain portions of our membrane, uh, what we can also do is break this apart into its component pieces. So what we can do is click on the brush and here in the editing panel, we can go into separate the brush into editable icons. So we click on that. There would just be a pop-up letting you know that, hey, this is going to be a one-way street. Um, we can go from a brush over to a grouped icon, but we can't go back. And what this means is that once we confirm this, we no longer have the flexibility to alter the structure of this brush. Um, so just make sure that this is all set before you hit confirm. Um, and then once you do, we can actually go, double click into this image here and then select the pieces that we want to, to edit. So for example, if we want to indicate that there's a lipid raft, we can highlight that section. And then here we can maybe change the color to make it stand out a bit more so that when our audience goes to take a look at this, um, we they're instantly drawn to like this region of our of our membrane. Um, and I'm going to talk about more of like different techniques that you can keep in mind for when you are wanting to like, you know, uh, guide your uh, your audience's attention around. There's like different ways that we can do it. And I'm going to show it to you in just uh, just a few minutes here. Um, and lastly, if like the icons and the brushes are individual uh, building blocks, the templates are actually fully formed structures that you are able to use for your uh, for your figures. And so if we go over to templates. Again, we do split them up into a number of different categories, uh, ranging from you know general figures to different pathways where we can hop in. Um, you can actually see a number of different pathways that we have available, or uh, different templates that sorry fit into this this category. Um, and what you'll notice as you browse through these templates is that they fall into two groups. You'll have those that are like very fleshed out, like this energy metabolism and uh, AMD uh, template. Um, and these fully fleshed templates are actually very valuable. Like as you prepare for your presentations, often you'll need to give some background to your talk before you dive into your own research. Rather than having to go into Google and find an illustration that like sort of matches what you want it to, Instead, look into the BioRender templates first. And I recommend doing that just because all of these templates are actually built from the same pieces that you have access to as well. And what this means is that I can go in and customize this template as I need. Um, so for example, you can see like there's text boxes here. So if I don't need these, I can actually just get rid of them. Or if I don't need any of this side at all, I can actually delete all of it, including this piece, and then crop my illustration. And so I can just like completely tuck that in here so that I'm only showing what I want my audience to see. And having this uh, flexibility means like you don't have to fight against like a, like a rasterized image anymore. You are able to like manipulate any of these pieces here to have it show exactly the way that you want. So highly recommend just taking a browse through the template library first before going uh, elsewhere because it can save you a lot of time. Um, Awesome. I see a couple of questions about like citations uh, here. Um, and so on the topic of uh, the, the templates as well, um, if you do need, to, if you are planning on using templates or your figures anywhere, um, if you click on the help bubble down below, um, there's actually an article that discusses how to cite BioRender. And then here you can actually see the three different scenarios for those uh, citations. Um, so whether you're creating it from scratch or adapting it from a template or using the template as is, we have the examples down below for you to um, uh, appropriately cite and credit bio render in your uh, in your work. Awesome. And now that we've kind of gone over like that brief review, I'm sure everyone here is very excited to uh, look to, to kind of uh, to learn about like some tips uh, and tricks that we want to keep in mind for when we're designing our slide figures. Um, and so going back to the, that idea 
that overarching idea of like presenting effectively, you know, making sure that our audience, regardless of how much time that they have uh, to spend with us, that they're able to get the message. Um, that's where like these tips were going to be focused on. Um, and so we're going to talk about like, you know, contrast and accessibility. We're going to talk about font sizing. We're going to talk about like how to walk your, uh, your, uh, your audience through your image, and we're going to use different examples throughout. Um, and so the examples themselves might not pertain to your specific field of research uh, exactly, um, but the concepts are very broadly applicable. So keep that in mind like as we go through. So the first step that I want to talk about here is about contrast and accessibility. Um, and the key thing here is to always check for contrast and accessibility, right? You want to make sure that what you're presenting to the audience, they can actually see it. Um, and one of the, one of the ways that we can actually do that in terms of contrast is actually remove all the color from our illustration. It seems like a little bit counterintuitive, counterintuitive here, um, but one way we can check to make sure that our text is legible is that when we strip the color away from it, we want to make sure that nothing fades into the background. And you can see that when we first have it in color, things look like they're all sort of present, like we can see most of it. Uh, but when we go ahead and take the color away, you can see that things start to blend into the background a little bit more, like the, the, the DNA sort of fades a little bit, that, um, that text from the macrophage sort of fades a bit more, like all these labels. Um, and this is an issue because now it's actually not the easiest for our audience to be able to see and understand like what is exactly on our page. And as well, you want to make sure that like our text is clearly legible. Um, like when we have it stacked on top of a lot of other things, especially when it goes through like lined areas, um, that makes it harder for us to follow. And what we want to do, and so again, like when we have when we see that things fade into the background, we want to make sure that we are uh, addressing those concerns. This should act as like a warning system for us to let us know that like, hey, we need to go back and adjust that uh, that contrast. And what we can do is, you know, some simple fixes. First, we'll just like move that text box away. And right away, even just by bringing it out onto like the, uh, onto the canvas where it's like complete, like a uniform color, that legibility like instantly improves. As well as like the strand of DNA here, like that was something that disappeared as well, right? Like you can see it kind of fade into the background. So what we can do is just click on that. And then here, maybe we turn it a little bit darker so that it stands out from my nucleus. And so when we go back and like uh, grayscale it again, you can see that this is very clean. It just like really pops off the page at you. And it like has that very strong contrast between my, uh, my background and my foreground. So definitely something to keep in mind there. Um, and I know that for uh, like the nucleus specifically, sometimes it is going to be more difficult. The reason being is that the nucleus stains darker compared to the rest of the cell already. And there's only a finite amount that you can of darkness that you can make your foreground, right? So like at some point, if I make this just like pitch black, um, practically there's, we can probably still keep going to some degree, uh, but there's, it's not going to make any difference at some point. And if that happens, what we can do is actually approach the issue from the other direction. Um, so if we have like a very uh, dark background, what we can do is actually use the transparency tool where we can click on that icon and then turn up the transparency. And then same thing, we're just like creating more separation between our foreground and our background elements. And it helps to, uh, and we can help to create that contrast a little bit better. And what I'm going to do is just wave a magic wand here. And I'm going to show you what it looks like after we've transformed those illustrations, this, uh, this figure with contrast and accessibility in mind. And you'll see that right away that our colors are standing quite a uh, quite a bit more apart. You can see even compared to like what we had initially, this is much clearer. Like our text is very legible. Our the components that are within the nucleus are very legible. And when we go to you know do our final check of grayscale, once we remove those colors, nothing fades into the background. And so this way it lets us know that like hey, this is a uh, this is a very accessible illustration, and it, um, and everything that I have on my page is uh, clearly legible. And this is also true for when we have like a lot of, uh, if we have like multiple foreground or sorry, if we have, let's say like a setting of our story. So you can see here in like this, um, the different stages of uh, lung cancer that 
right now, the lungs actually form more of the context for our story. But given how much opacity there is in the lungs, it still, it almost like jumps at you more than the tumor does. So in this case, and like when we have elements that are uh, more for context purposes, as opposed to being like a main character, what we want to do is kind of fade those into the background a little bit. Like, for example, you can see down below, we have like this liver, um, and then we are showing a metastasis. Um, that we actually fade that into the background. And we can actually do that for our lungs as well. So if we increase the transparency here across the board, now the main character in our story is those uh, are the tumors that we're seeing. Um, and then the lungs are still present. You're, you know where that story is, take, is, uh, is taking place, but the focus is going to be on the tumor themselves. Um, so just something to keep in mind that like being like using uh, the transparency and like creating that contrast can help you highlight, you know, who are the main characters, where that setting is, and be able to make that story even clearer. Now, the next group of tips that I want to talk with uh, talk about with everyone is about font size and legibility. So previously, like when we we're looking at legibility was uh, more about like having appropriate contrast. Um, but let, we can take that a step further as well. It's like kind of make sure that all of our everything on our screen is legible, right? Um, and if we go and take a look at this first example here, something that I want to emphasize with regards to font size is it's not the absolute font size that is the key. Um, it's actually the ratio of the font size against the um, against like the canvas or like the size of the illustration. And what I mean by that here is if I just click on this text box, you can actually see the font size that I'm using is an eight. So it's actually very small. But because of the size of the canvas, it is an appropriate size. Um, so if I go over to uh, canvas size, you can hear that, see that we're about like nine, about like a little shy of 10 inches against six inches. And because it's also blown up on my screen, it's actually very legible despite it being like a relatively small magnitude. And even if I go to present this figure, all of that, uh, all of that text is still is still relatively legible. Um, you know, we could definitely do a little bit of work here to make it a little bit bigger. Um, but uh, it isn't like the worst. However, if we were to expand this canvas quite a bit more, so I'm just going to go and just show you what it is. Like, let's say I'm going to make this quite a bit bigger here. So my text is occupying relatively less space. And if I go back to present now, you'll see right away, like that same font size of eight actually looks quite a bit smaller. Um, and so again, just like a idea for yourselves, uh, like the, the concept here is that it's not just about the font size, but how it sits on the canvas itself. Um, and again, because like we're presenting, a lot of us present virtually, it's not something we think, stop to think about as often, because like if the font size is a little bit smaller, you know, you can always you know, lean into your screen a little bit, get a little bit closer, or you might be able to uh, magnify it on your end to make it uh, a little bit bigger. Um, but when we go and present in like lecture halls, or if we're in like big conference rooms, that's not a, that's not going to be a luxury that we're going to have. So we want to make sure that our font is an appropriate size. And and something that you can do just to make sure that your your font is a, is is legible is before your presentation just go to that room you know throw the presentation up onto the projector and then sit in the back of the room um because that's the furthest point that someone's going to be from your screen. And so if you are able to read the text from the back of the room, that means everyone else in the room will also be able to see it as well. So just a, just an idea for everyone says, uh, as a way to quality control your slides, just make sure that everything is legible. Uh, alternatively, like, you know, if you have branding requirements, like potentially like there's going to be, you know, font, uh, font guidelines as well. Um, and so that uh, you can follow. But if there aren't and you want to make sure things are legible, quick check is just to throw it on the screen and then go to the back of the room. And something to keep in mind as well is that like, you know, after you've created your illustration and, you know, you go and test, you go to present your figure and you find that like, hey, like some of my font is a little bit small. Um, what we can do, what we might be tempted to do is just simply like go and then like crank up the the size of like each of these uh, text boxes, like maybe we push it to an 11. Um, but something to keep in mind as we do this is that it will alter the positioning of our text boxes. And so when that happens, what we want to do is just make sure that we're cleaning that up. Um, and 
to do that, we can we can just make sure that our boxes are aligned just by using like those guidelines that pop up. Uh, alternatively, we can also select like all the different text boxes here. So I'm just going to select a bunch of these, um, and then we can go up top to the align tool, and then have them align down the center. Whoops, not the center, down the middle. And this will bring all the boxes in alignment to each other. So it still gives it like a very crisp and clean uh, look. And it shows that, you know, you're paying attention to like all the little details of your figure. Um, and so just to keep in mind that like, as you uh, change the font size, it might change the positioning of your text boxes. And so I'm just going to wave a magic wand here and just kind of highlight like how we can clean that up. And even now, like as we're going through like this figure, something that might have been distracting for everyone is that these steps are not in line with each other. Um, and it's like these little things that distract from your presentation. Like if you caught on to that, likely as I started talking about changing like the font sizes, um, you were trying to figure out why it looks like this. And then like why I didn't clean it up. Um, and once that happens, like you lose your at, at your audience's attention. Now they're focused on something else that you don't want them to be focused on. It just detracts from your message. Um, so I'm just going to, you know, wave my magic wand here. And then here, when we use that align, uh, if we use like go to align our uh, all of the uh, elements, you can see now this is one crisp line that goes across our entire page. Um, and then also like all the text boxes that we've adjusted are also lined up as well. And so again, having all of those little details taken care of means that our audience is paying attention to the parts that we want them to. Um, and the last tip here as well, like feel free to resize your canvas if you need more room, like if you're uh, on like a slide deck, whatever it is. Uh, oh, I see your question here. Perfect timing. There are grid lines as well. It's like the help with alignment. If you have, you can apply it. There's like on the navigational toolbar here, there's a grid that you can apply and then you can change like the size of the grid as well uh, to give you the uh, flexibility of, uh, you know, looking at uh, alignment and spacing. So um, that is another way to help you with the alignment. And also you can drop ruler lines as well if uh, the grid lines are a little bit too busy. Uh, so we can just drop, you can see that, you know, everything is perfectly centered. Um, and again, this is uh, very helpful for making sure that our audience is uh, attentive to what we want them to be. Awesome. Um, and so I think for many of us, like when we go to present an illustration, oftentimes like our figure is complex. Um, especially for like something like a pathway diagram, like this uh, insulin uh, binding uh, uh, pathway. I think for a lot of us, like when we go and into seminars and we go into talks, oftentimes we'll see some sort of pathway slide, maybe like this, maybe it's even more detailed. Like you have lots of different proteins, lots of different branches. Um, and I don't know about for everyone in the room today, but for myself, what I found was that those can actually be pretty overwhelming, especially if I'm not intimately familiar with that field. It seems like there's a lot of information there that I'm trying to take in all at once while also listening to the speaker. Um, and when that happens, like it's harder for me to absorb that information because like there's so much competing information that I'm trying to like sift through. And what we want to do instead is actually break this apart into like its component steps. And what I mean by that here, like you see here that I have like, you know, four steps that this pathway sort of comes together. Um, and when I go to present this illustration, rather than having, uh, rather than spending like a lot of time on this slide with everything presented, what I can do is first show this as an overview and then afterwards break it down into its individual parts. So I'm actually going to go into presenter mode here to just show you what I mean. So first we talk about uh, you know, this is uh, the pathway that, um, you know, insulin triggers uh, glucose absorption. And when we talk about the insulin uh, binding portion, we can actually remove all of that extra information to focus on this insulin binding part. And then afterwards, when we talk about the signal cascade, we can then bring that into view. After, when we go into step three with our exocytosis and, you know, uh, GLUT4 uh, uh, binding to our, uh, to our membrane, we can then bring that into view. And then lastly, we can then uh, discuss like glucose entry into the cell. And so by breaking this into its individual parts, it's a lot easier to follow rather than spending our entire time on this slide and trying to walk our audience through like each step while everything is also present, having this kind of show up as we go much more, it's just easier to kind of like walk our audience through again, to just break down a very complex illustration into bite-sized pieces that they can uh, more easily digest.
and I think that's like something that we sort of intuitively do already, right? Like, you know, for a lot of us, if we have a lot of slides, we have things appear one at a time. But a cool trick that I wanted to show everyone as well, is just like a different approach that we can take. So different example here, um, where we talk about ligand binding all the way to like the nuclear phase, um, more of like a, sort of like a generic ligand binding uh, mechanism of action. Um, so again, you can see that we have like a relatively complex illustration. But what you notice here is that this also sort of breaks into three parts, right? We have ligand binding, then we have the cytosolic phase, then we have the nuclear phase. And what we can do is do something very similar, is have the illustration kind of come together um, in pieces. And so I'm going to walk you through what I'm going to do here so you can get some ideas on how you might be able to incorporate it for yourselves. Uh, so first, I'm actually going to make a few duplicates of this. So there's three, um, three chapters to my story here. So I'm going to make three duplicates of this illustration. And when I first go to present my illustration, I'm going to uh, you know, give that overview. Now we're going to talk about uh, this pathway. And then when we first, when we go in, uh, when we start off, we want to maybe take a look. We want to focus only on ligand binding. So what I'm going to do is actually select both my cytostolic and nuclear phases and then have them fade into the background. So I'm going to turn this into just a little bit more transparent. I'm just going to unlock this, make this also transparent here. Oops, I'm going to make this 70 as well as make it nice and even. There we go. And then in my the next section, I want, to, I want my audience to focus on the cytosolic phase. So I'm going to select all of my ligand binding, make that 70, make this 70 as well. And then we'll fade out these two arrows. Sorry, the patterning for my arrows might be a little bit off, but bear with me for a second here. I'm going to go back to this one and also have this one fade. And then lastly, when we go back to the, when we go to like the last chapter of our story, we want to be, want our audience to be focused on the nuclear phase. So in this case, I'm going to turn chapters one and two a little bit more into the background. And I'm going to show you this final effect because it is super cool. So now we have everything appropriately uh, transparent. So now when I start back at the beginning of my story, I go to present here and I talk about this uh, as a whole. And then when I go to discuss ligand binding, I can fade everything else into the background. I missed a couple pieces here, my apologies. Um, but we can discuss the ligand binding part. And then when we go to talk about the cytosolic phase, then we can move the color into the middle. And then lastly, when we go to talk about the nuclear phase, we can move that, um, we can move the transparency at the end there. And now it's almost like a spotlight. We're highlighting the part of the illustration that we want our audience to be focused on while still keeping that entire story in context. So people are able to understand like where in our, uh, where in that flow of information that we are at uh, without being like completely overwhelming. Because again, we're using like those bright colors to, fo to focus our audience like on the portions that we want them to. So just a different way of like, you know, breaking down your story into, into individual parts. Hopefully this is giving some folks like ideas on how they might be able to incorporate it into like their own like more complex uh, illustrations. Awesome. So in these last like nine minutes here, what I want to do is just talk about crop and call out. Um, and uh, we're, we're, it's sort of like on the along the lines of like making our illustrations more bite sized and also at the same time, making sure that things are accessible. Um, and I have a couple examples here that I want to um, that I want to share. So let's say that you have a illustration like this uh, tumor in my brain in the brain. And what we want to do is actually highlight the tumor piece and we want to bring that make that bigger. Now, instinctively, you might be thinking like, oh, I can grab this uh, brain and then just make this a lot bigger to help bring that tumor into view. But the problem here is that now I have a lot of, my brain is taking up a lot of room, right? It's taking up a lot of like my canvas, but not it's not necessarily adding a ton of value to my illustration because I really wanted to just focus on the tumor itself. Um, and instead, what we can do is create almost like a call out. So we're going to make a duplicate of this image. And then after, we're going to make one more duplicate from there. 
actually we'll just work with two. So let's say we want to just call out the tumor. So what we're going to do is actually make a copy of this here. And then we're going to make this one really big. Um, and you'll see it come together in just a moment. I know it's kind of weird. I just said, Hey, don't make the, don't make this bigger. Um, but what we can do is actually take advantage of the cropping tool. So if we go and click on the icon, we have this crop function at the top. And I like using a circle collar just because it makes me, it makes it feel like a magnifying glass, um, but you can use another shape if you want to. So, but I'm going to use a circle and I'm just going to highlight it over that tumor. And I'm just going to try and make this into, a, into more of a circle here. And then we can highlight that. And when I click out of editing the crop, you can actually see now that we've zoomed into that tumor quite a bit more without having the rest of my brain take up a lot of space. And then we can even connect these two illustrations uh, simply by going and looking for like maybe a zoom call out to act like my magnifying glass. Um, let's grab, let's grab this one here. I like this one. Uh, so different options to choose from. It really is up to you how you, which one you choose. There's no wrong answer. Um, you can add your own style into it. I just prefer this one with the tail. Uh, so we can move this into position. So first we're going to arrange this icon here and have that fit inside my circle. So we're going to go and kind of just hover over this like so. Make this just a smidge bigger to incorporate all of that. And then once we have that in place, we're going because this is a grouped icon, what I'm going to do is actually adjust these tails. So double click and then just have it go towards my tumor like so. And then right away and I'll you clean this up just a little bit so that it stays within the boundaries of my magnifying glass. And so now I've created like my own call out. I'm able to zoom into that tumor without needing to add a lot of like extra stuff all around it. So a quick way to do that. And we can do the same thing with like this mouse icon too. Like if we have like a, like a stereo or like a very complex apparatus that we want to be able to, you know, highlight and have everyone be able to see, but at the same time, be able to focus on the mouse. We can replicate this in the same way where we just make a duplicate of it. Whoops. We're just going to make a duplicate. And then, whoops, here we go. I'm going to copy this and then paste it here. I have a little bit of Butterfingers, my fault, everybody. Um, but yeah, same thing. You can like make a duplicate of that. And then we can repeat the same thing where we make this a lot bigger. And then we can zoom into, uh, we can zoom into that illustration without necessarily adding to like a ton of real estate or occupying like a ton of space for our, for our mouse. Um, so something that we can, uh, that we can look at just a way to you know, zoom into more specific portions of our illustration. Um, awesome. Uh, and that's like the final tip that I wanted to share with everyone here. Hopefully, like all of these have given you ideas on how you can uh, incorporate your own, incorporate them into like your own slide decks and your uh, into your own presentations. Again, like going back to it, like we want to like, regardless of like what presentation or what deck that you're building for, you want to make sure that you're able to quickly and efficiently impart those uh, your, your message to your audience. And hopefully these tips can help you uh, achieve that there. You know, and as we wrap up, I wanted to, you know, thank everyone for, for taking the time uh, to, to join me, uh, you know, for all the great questions I can see from, uh, from like the Q and a, uh, uh, from the Q and a that, you know, tons of illustrate, tons of questions have been asked. Um, and as we start to um, uh, hop off here, just want to launch one last quick poll, just uh, trying to get your feedback on how uh, valuable you found this um, uh, this content. It helps us understand like what sort of uh, direction that we should go in, like if this is valuable, things that we should tweak. Um, so if you can uh, if you can kind of uh, share your thoughts here, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and so keep an eye out for the recording that's going to be sent out for everybody, um, as well someone on the Bowerbender team uh, will also be reaching out in the future if you to see if you'd like to request a demo for your team, your department head or whoever else might be, and also to learn more about potentially bringing like an institutional uh, license uh, for uh, if you are interested in bringing like an institutional license to your organization, uh, you can also let them know as well.